Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, hemp is a commodity that can now be grown in Minnesota. One lawmaker provides more information on its uses, and the DNR commissioner takes the temperature of this state's natural resources. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Protecting and managing Minnesota's wealth of natural resources, the land, water, fish, and wildlife is the role of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. In January, Governor Tim Walz appointed the first woman to lead this agency, and Commissioner Sarah Strawman joins me now to talk about the accomplishments and challenges facing the DNR. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. So prior to becoming commissioner, you were assistant commissioner, meaning that you came to this position with a richer understanding of some of the challenges facing the DNR. Broadly speaking, how are our natural resources faring right now? You know, in many ways, I think our resources are doing well. We have a really robust um, base of public lands, you know, from state parks to wildlife areas uh, to lakes and, and rivers. Um, you know, we're, we're continuing to add to those to create more opportunities and more habitat. Uh, we have uh, a really engaged constituency all across Minnesota. People are very passionate about their natural resources. And, you know, also in Minnesota, we're really fortunate to have some funding resources like the, the lottery proceeds, the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund and, and the Legacy Funds. Um, but, you know, there's still challenges. And um, we're still, you know, working on issues like chronic wasting disease um, that's threatening our deer. Uh, invasive species, both terrestrial and aquatic, we're still losing habitat, particularly in our grasslands and our wetlands, and uh, climate change is going to be a long-term issue. So those are many of the challenges that we'll be working on over the next four years. And a few of those I want to touch on in greater detail, but before we get there, I want to talk about um, recently to Minnesota Public Radio, you said that you're committed to connecting more people to the outdoors, and you spoke about how passionate Minnesotans are about their outdoors anyway, but including adding Wi-Fi to campgrounds or, and increasing accessibility for those with disabilities. But how do we balance, you know, increasing the access to our parks without having them be loved to death, as, as has been noted in our national parks? Right, and so um, part of the reason that, I, you know, I feel that connecting people to the outdoors is so important is um, you know, first of all, it's really important for the long-term relevancy of our natural resources. People uh, care about those things that they have personal experience with, and so having that personal experience in the outdoors is really important. It's also a really big uh, component of our economy in Minnesota, and our natural resources and our outdoor opportunities also are really important to the prosperity of communities all across the state. And then, of course, there's our own individual health and wellness. You know, we just feel better when we get that time outdoors. And so to get more people outside, I use those examples of Wi-Fi and campgrounds and, and making places more accessible um, as, way, as, as a reminder that this isn't just about marketing you know, experiences and certain sets of values to new audiences. It's also about thinking about the experiences and values that those people we want to have those experiences you know, are seeking. And so um, it isn't going to be every park that has Wi-Fi. It isn't going to be every corner of every park that's accessible, but it is important to give uh, people with disabilities that whole park experience, not just the visitor center, but a trail or, you know, some kind of park experience. And so those are really just examples to kind of challenge our thinking. Um, really, though, it is important. Part of our mission is to protect and conserve. And so I think one of the things, you know, we'll, we'll be cautious of and, and evaluate our proposals, and we hear them sometimes, well, if we just reduce restrictions, um, we just reduce our regulations, we open that up, that'll reduce barriers and get more people outside. And that may or may not be true. You know, I think that the choices we make are data-driven. We know there are things that are likely to reduce barriers and get more people outside. We don't want to just follow every idea that may or may not get people outside and actually may have an impact on our resources. Well, and speaking of getting people outside, Minnesota has a rich heritage of outdoorsmanship, but it's been historically male outdoorsmanship. The DNR has had programs for many years to teach women about archery and fishing and hunting. But we also have growing diversity among our youth. So what is the DNR doing to, to reach out to those people who don't have this tradition and build this next generation of people who will love their parks? 
Yeah, well, one of the things we're doing is we have a great program called I Can, and it's a skill building um, program. And so we have um, I Can Fish, I Can Camp, I Can Paddle. And um, these programs are aimed not only at kids, but really at families. So, you know, if you are a family, particularly a family that may not have camping or fishing in your experience, it's a way to go, um, you know, in a safe sp space with instructors, the equipment is provided, take your family and experience that with other families and instructors, you know, who can help you through that. Um, so that's been a great program. We've been doing that for 10 years. Um, a lot of the efforts of that are aimed at uh, multicultural communities and um, getting new folks engaged in the outdoors. We also have a diversity of uh, education programs that are aimed at kids and often school groups. So we have Minaqua program, which is a um, aquatic habitat and fishing education program. We have a school forest program. Um, and so there are a variety of ways that, that we're aiming at kids and families because of course, you know, families that uh, spend time outdoors together, we think that supports the kids becoming adults who spend time outdoors as well. Yeah, it becomes part of a tradition, a family tradition. During the last legislative session, chronic wasting disease rose to the top and you mentioned this earlier in your comments um, as something that the state really needs to address. Um, how we address it remains a question. What is the current state of CWD in our deer population and what's, what needs to be done to really get it under control? I think we're at a really critical point um, in terms of how we address the disease going forward. So we, we are at a place where we have persistent infection in southeast Minnesota. We have a case of one wild deer in Crow Wing County um, that was found to be infected. But it appears that the infection is still recent enough and localized enough um, that we can do something about it. And so I think it's really important that as a department we continue our monitoring and surveillance uh, efforts to continue to understand where the disease is at and how prevalent it is, um, that we uh, continue our work to reduce deer densities. And so we do that by working with hunters, landowners, and then in some cases we're uh, doing targeted culling through the um, U.S. Department of Agriculture. And then, um, you know, we're also working uh, more closely with the Board of Animal Health, which is the agency that, that regulates uh, captive deer facilities. That's, that's another really important piece that we're um, focusing on infection in those captive herds. And then also the research and the testing. And, and so working with the University of Minnesota, they receive some funding too. I think all, all of those pieces are really important to make sure we're positioned to do everything we can um, to uh, eliminate and or contain the disease. But movement in the right direction has happened as of late, in your view? I believe so, and we'll see, you know, as we continue to test um, deer if we're getting the results that we want, you know, to see. But I think we are doing the right things that we would expect um, to be able to have a fighting chance of having success. One result of the last legislative session was money for the DNR's non-game wildlife program, which works to help over 700 species thrive. The program had been funded by people checking off the box on their on their income tax return, but now there's dedicated funds for that. What will this money be used for? Um, I understand it's a great way for citizens to get more involved. What are some of the programs that they can get involved with? Yeah, and, and um, so there was new uh, LCCMR funding, Environment Trust Fund uh, funding for um, the non-game program this year. And the non-game program is really um, a wonderful way for citizens to engage in, in the outdoors and with our wildlife and with the department because they deal with so many of our iconic species, you know, bald eagles and um, loons. And people may be familiar with the bald eagle cam. You know, it's always mm -hmm. fun to, to watch the eggs and the chicks and uh, follow the eagle families. Um, but some of the things with this funding specifically, um, it's we're going to be able to expand some of the work we do with citizen loon monitoring. Uh, I know we're launching a new website that actually allows people to um, input their observations that way and, and pick the areas they want to monitor. Um, we'll be able to do new work on our frog and toad surveys, again, using citizen observations. And then some of the new things that we're going to be able to engage people with on, are on uh, work on bats and actually having people record bat vocalizations. And then we can take those recordings and, and analyze them. And then also insects as well. So lots of great ways for people to get involved. And check your website for more information on that. Commissioner Strawman, I want to thank you for coming today, and I hope you'll come back again. Thank you so much. Glad to come back.
This week, Governor Walls held a ceremonial bill signing for a new law that strengthens protections for workers and makes wage theft a felony. When we talk about the United States and Minnesota being the land of opportunity, part of what I always have in mind is the idea that if you work hard, I mean, you throw your back into it, that you're going to be able to do better for yourself and your family. It's going to pay off. Eventually, that hard work is going to make your family's life better, except if there's wage theft. If there's wage theft, you could work as hard as you want to, but your wages are stuck. Not only are they stuck, you're not even getting the money that you work for. And this is why it is particularly wrong. It's not just dollars and cents. It's a matter of dignity and honoring labor and honoring the hard work people do. Men and women go to work every day for eight hours, and they should get paid for eight hours. And the idea that in the state of Minnesota, for the last 7,500 years, it's always been just an administrative uh, issue that had to be dealt with through, um, without the power of law behind it. Today, although I expect most of it to all be administrative, we now have a felony charge against these thieves that are stealing money from working people. That's amazing. We now have the toughest wage theft law in the nation. I'm proud of this bill. I'm proud that it's being modeled by other states. Um, and I'm proud that we were able to take a, a very balanced approach in, in looking at the needs, the rights of workers along with the needs and responsibilities of employers to make sure that they all balanced out uh, and everybody could walk away knowing that um, we're going to try to be fair here in the state of Minnesota. Wage theft is a term that has become a rallying cry against illegal practices such as not paying workers for all hours worked, not paying workers for overtime worked, not paying workers the legally required and agreed to rate, delaying the payment of wages, or worse, not paying them at all. And the first step in combating wage theft is to enact strong laws that empower workers with needed information about the terms and conditions of their employers and protect them from retaliation when they believe their employers are not playing by the rules. The impacts on this financially are three times more than robberies in, in the state of Minnesota. So this is uh, the same thing as if they walked in and took the money from you. Um, but it's insidious in that it undermines our faith in our system. When people hear about hemp, they might think of recreational marijuana. Recreational marijuana is illegal in Minnesota, but growing hemp is allowed. Hemp is used for clothing, textiles, construction materials, plastic alternatives, and health supplements. Joining me is Senator Carla Bigham, who has authored several bills to bring clarity to laws regarding the use of hemp. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you for having me, Shannon. So in 2016, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture initiated an industrial hemp research pilot yep. program. And then the 2018 federal farm bill removed hemp as a control, controlled substance. So with commodity prices for corn and soybeans being on the low end, how much interest in there is there now in hemp as a new crop? A lot. Uh, just in 2019 alone, there's over 300 permits that um, have been pulled. I mean, this is a big, diverse uh, commodity, and it's breeding a new generation of farmers. And I think it's fantastic that um, we are able to um, pass legislation, work together across the aisle um, to really benefit our agriculture community, but more important, our economy. I really want Minnesota to be the number one producer of industrial hemp for a couple of reasons. One, uh, for all the issues that are in items that you mentioned, this is a more environmentally sustainable product, whether it's insulation, textiles. Uh, there's even people looking at how we can make this into uh, a fuel and an, a motor oil, which would burn cleaner than what we currently have. So but the sky's the limit, Shannon, on, on this product. So there's a lot of room for innovation, yes. but we still have laws and regulations Correct. that are, you know, making this a difficult area to navigate. Last yes. month, a Minnesota hemp farmer from southern Minnesota was charged with felonies because his crop had too much yeah. THC, which is the psychoactive element. Yeah. Do 
What do state lawmakers still have to do to just make this a clearer playing field? Well, we did uh, a few things this, this uh, year on that. We actually complied with the federal farm bill. Uh, there was still some ambiguity. I have uh, the largest uh, hemp farm in the state of Minnesota in my district, and there's been issues with financial services, accounts being shut down, um, and, different, and, and shipping companies not wanting to transport products once it's been processed. Uh, you know, the, the rules are the rules, and uh, according to the law, the state can't, um, uh, ha or the product can't have more than 0.3% uh, THC, otherwise it is considered marijuana. So, um, you know, hopefully that all gets worked out with the farmer, but um, we passed uh, legislation this year related to CBD oil, also allowing the industrial hemp farmers to sell to the medicinal marijuana manufacturers, such as LeafLine, which also happens to be in my district, um, and and then also uh, complying with the federal tax bill, which decriminalized industrial hemp, and we specifically define it as saying industrial hemp is not marijuana according to the criminal code. So as you said, it can be used for a variety of purposes, yes. clothing, textiles, plastic alternatives, but the greatest growth has been CBD oil. Yes. What is CD, CBD oil and what is it used for? So uh, CBD oil is cannabinoid oil, which is derived from industrial hemp, and there are a lot of health benefits to it. I personally use it. I had a, a very bad break on my right foot a few years ago and I've had three surgeries on it and it was painful and I didn't think I would ever feel like pain free or be able to have that mobility to run or to snowshoe. Uh, it was it was bad and I started taking CBD oil derived from industrial hemp uh, in February and it has made all the difference and I talk about it all the time because I think for people that uh, have aches and pains I also turned 40 in March and I rumor <laughs> is that you get a little achy and pain you know? <laughs> yes. and so this has helped um, I think just with that as well um, I don't suffer from anxiety but the people that do it's also been proven to benefit with that um, and it, it just is a, a good product that I have had proven benefits with I can testify to that the FDA uh, has to come out with some clarity. I'm not, you know, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, and this year we did have a bill that clarifies around the labeling and test, uh, testing of CBD oil. You know, some of this stuff is expensive. It could be upwards of $100 for a, a bottle uh, that you take, you know, as a dropper. And you don't want that to be, say, maple syrup coming across as CBD and not having, um, you know, the, the truth in the product that's in, in the bottle. So part of this bill uh, has labeling requirements. Then the next part is that they do have to have third-party testing so that there are, um, you know, there's no pesticides or, or anything like that that could adversely affect the, con you know, the consumption of the product. So there was, a, there was an article in the Star Tribune mm -hmm. kind of about this issue yeah. um, in April. They called it the wild, wild west. Yes. As you said, the FDA is not really taking a stand yet. There's Correct. a lot of people like yourself with testimonials about mm -hmm. how great these products are, and yet there's really no scientific Correct. information or studies. So yeah. what do people need to know about these products? Well, I think it'll be helpful. I just read an article that says that the FDA is coming out, I think, in the fall, late summer, fall, with, with at least some parameters on it. Um, I, you know, I think using it for yourself, doing your research, um, is always, to me, the, the best benefit of it. But talk to, the, talk to the producers. A lot of these are locally uh, sourced and, and local farmers, and they are happy to talk about what their products are, how they uh, cultivate and, and what they use and what parts of the plant they use uh, for, for the CBD oil. So that's what I also would encourage. They, you know, these farmers are fantastic and they really do like to talk about their products. So just get in contact with them for now until, you, uh, until we have some of the requirements. The bill that we passed this year doesn't start until January. And so uh, to give people time, you know, mm -hmm. the, pro the producers of uh, and the processor's time to, to get in compliance with the law. So uh, that would be my recommendation as of now. You successfully got an amendment added at yes. the end of session that would um, charge the Board of Pharmacy mm -hmm. with looking into any complaints Correct. that arise around CBD oil. Yeah. 
Is, is that just the first step? I mean, what else needs to be done? Well, I think it is the first step because right now there was nobody to call if you thought you had maple syrup in this bottle that you bought at whatever corner store. I mean, you can buy CBD oil at pretty much any grocery store. It also allowed the Board of Pharmacy to put parameters around itself to say like, you know, when you have places like Hy-Vee uh, that have a pharmacy that's open next to food and clothing and all that, and Colburn's and those types of stores, it also gives them a little bit of uh, parameters as well. So that's helpful. But, you know, I think when you look at um, how these products will evolve, um, you know, it's important to continue to have these conversations and have the conversations with the Department of Agriculture, with the Board of Pharmacy, and also, to be honest, any, um, you know, any rulemaking that has to come down, working with the Attorney General to make sure that all of these are safe products for consumption of, uh, for humans, but also for animals. This is also something that uh, some vets use for uh, dogs uh, that have anxiety, especially. So from your point of view right now you do your homework but yeah. but there is safety for the gummies the ointments the yes. vapes and the creams that are currently available in yep. the state and if you feel like uh something isn't uh what it's supposed to be i would get a hold of the board of pharmacy and and uh that their staff is fantastic and they will work with you but uh, in january that bill becomes law senator carla bigham thank you so much i hope to hear more about this in the future thank you for having me Following the sudden resignation of former Senator Tony Lurie as Commissioner of the Department of Human Services, Governor Walls spoke to the press. At times this happens in, in organizations and I think that uh, the resignation letter from the Commissioner is, is very self-aware that maybe this is the wrong leadership style at this time to achieve the goals that we're looking for because I think it's obvious that we are we're asking for we're asking for change in a different way. We're asking our commissioners to lean into things. We're asking them to explore new ways of doing things. You saw it at DPS in Minute, um, and you're seeing it with other agencies, and I think Commissioner Lori said that I got you through this, I helped you get this budget, I got the provider tax sunset removed. Um, now it's time for someone else's skill set to step in. Later that day, Republican lawmakers called a press conference to express concern over the recent upheavals. It's my understanding the governor is going to appoint an interim commissioner, and it would be my expectation that the culture at the Department of Human Services would change, that they would focus on accountability, transparency, and serving the taxpayers. Obviously, there is a significant cultural issue that is going to need to be remedied. I would encourage the governor to support his interim appointment by having private sector experts come forward to assist. We cannot have the same cast of characters if we hope for significant change in this department that serves a million Minnesotans, takes a significant portion of our budget, and has been entrenched as a bureaucracy that has failed over and over again. I like to say that DHS right now is a dumpster fire. With Chuck Johnson, who has served as acting OIG in Ms. Ham's absence, now leaving, we need to know from Governor Walls what the plan is to turn the page at the Inspector General's office to ensure it is fulfilling its mission to DHS. I wish obviously things were going better at DHS, but unfortunately uh, there's been some turmoil uh, in the last few weeks and particularly obviously over the weekend. Um, you know, we were very alarmed to hear that the commissioner was resigning uh, this morning. Uh, we probably assume that that is appropriate and that there are uh, things going on at DHS that warrant that resignation. Um, I think it's time now that Minnesotans know what those reasons are. Um, we're calling for more transparency. We want to know exactly what's going on at DHS. Uh, we have the top three officials at DHS uh, who have now exited. Uh, we have the Inspector General who has been on administrative leave uh, for four months without an, uh, uh, an investigation actually starting into uh, her performance. Um, uh, you know, to me, that's uh, mismanagement of the highest level. Historian Brian Pease describes one of the Capitol's unique features in our occasional series, The People's House. The second floor of the State Capitol is really the focal point of all of the activity that happens here. 
What was Cass Gilbert's idea behind this particular design? The uh, second floor is really called the grand floor of the Capitol because it's where everyone can come up here, get access to the chambers, the House, the Senate, and the Supreme Court. And it's a place where all that activity is taking place each day of session. So you have people lobbying for interest groups here. You have the public that are here to talk to their legislators and so forth or go to the Supreme Court for their hearings. So really the, the envision that Cass Gilbert had for this uh, space and the second floor was to be a grand space where you really get a sense of the, the architecture, these beautiful colonnades of Italian marble column and Minnesota stone. And you also get a place where people feel friendly or welcoming into those spaces as at the same time they're visiting or coming here for business. In the other capitals I've visited, I've noticed that the House Chamber is often across from the Senate Chamber, but not here in our capital. What is the reason for that? Well, I think what Cass Gilbert was looking at doing is creating a, a symmetrical building. And so we have, in 1905, there were 63 senators, not the 67 we have today, but we had 119 House members. So that's almost twice the size. So I think for him, how you construct a building with one end of the building with a smaller chamber and the other opposite end with a huge chamber just doesn't fit architecturally. So he put the Senate chamber on the west side of the building, the Supreme Court, a smaller chamber of course, on the opposite end and then the house because of its size fit perfectly in the north corridor or the north side of the buildings. It may just be a matter of folklore but I've read that the placement of the house chamber looking at the city of St. Paul is important in terms of representing the people, that the speaker is looking at the people. Is that true? Yeah, and that, that's a lot of people look at the, the way the uh, spaces have been designed or laid out, uh, that Gilbert was looking at the house being kind of the approachable. It's more of the people's house. The members serve a two-year term, so there's more rotation or more changeover as uh, members leave or get uh, re-elected or not re-elected. And there are more of them. And there's more of them as well. And so the idea is, it kind of symbolically, it faces the public, faces downtown St. Paul. In 1905, when the Capitol opened, the cons all of the state's constitutional offices were housed in this building, and that's not true today. Can you talk more about that? Sure. The uh, whole idea of the building here was, this is the seat of state government. So you have your executive branch officers, you have the governor, lieutenant governor, the state treasurer, the state auditor, the uh, secretary of state. Uh, the Attorney General all housed within this one building in 1905. And that gives you a sense of how this building has changed over its 112 year history because you have uh, a lot of those constitutional officers moving out to different chambers. They're going into uh, the state office building back in the 60s and the 70s. You had the administration building where the treasurer moved into. Now the treasurer we as a constitutional amendment abolished the treasurer's office so there no longer is a treasurer. And that also fits in with the, the history of the Supreme Court too. They uh, were, until the 1990s, uh, everything they had here, the offices, the law library, the chamber was their headquarters, kind of their center gathering place for all the work and all the business they do. And then when the uh, Judicial Center was open, they moved there. And so they have new uh, Supreme Court and appellate court offices and also uh, chambers there. But they still use this space in the state capitol as an important part of their connection to this building. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for joining us.